Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Michael Lofton Show here on Reason and Theology on a Thursday, joined by my guest, Joshua Zetkoff, a Christian converted to Christianity, has a powerful testimony that I am really, really excited to talk about. I first saw him on Michael Knowles' show where he goes over his testimony in uh, great detail. I highly recommend that y'all go and watch it. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, but I decided to bring him on here to kind of uh, recap some of those things in a, in a summary fashion. So, Josh, welcome to the show. How are you? Hi, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Doing good. Thanks for I'm having me up here. Oh man, it's it's exciting. Like I said, I really enjoyed uh, your testimony, and so just wanted to bring you on and talk about it. I thought it was a, a powerful test testimony to God's grace in a person's life, and so I, I kind of wanted to bring that to the audience here. So let's maybe just start out with your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm from uh, you know Virginia, Northern Virginia, about 30 minutes uh, south of DC, and so that's where I've lived my whole life. Uh, I was I was born um, into a Russian Orthodox family. Mainly, it was my my father who was you know he was raised Russian Orthodox, and and he was raised in that way. And then my my mom kind of you know converted uh, to, to she was baptized Russian Orthodox, and so I was I was baptized Russian Orthodox. Um, and you know, so I attended church as a child and, um, I had a good childhood, you know, like that's one thing I can say is that I, I really had a solid childhood as far as like, mm. you know, healthy parents for them, you know, obviously they're, they're human, we're all human. So we all have our little issues or whatever, but it wasn't like anything super crazy. It wasn't like an abusive household mm. or anything like that. So I had a good, um, childhood. And so I was raised, uh, you know, going to church, but I wasn't indoctrinated. And that's one thing that I kind of clarify is that we went to church, but it was literally as simple as, OK, Sunday, go to church. And then that was it. Like the Bible mm -hmm. wasn't talked about. I wasn't talked, you know, spoken to about doctrine or theology, mm -hmm. anything like that. And so it was I didn't know anything about anything, really. I just knew we go to church Sunday. And so. Um, I stopped going to church when I was probably like 10. Once I was old enough to stay home alone, you know, I stopped going and they didn't, you know, they didn't mind. And so as, as growing up, I, pl I played a lot of sports and that was kind of my main thing as a child. Um, when I got to about the age of, of 12, um, I started messing and dabbling with uh, marijuana and, mm -hmm. and it was due to really I was, it was two things i was a curious kid was the main thing was probably what i just wanted to try it i'm seeing it in movies you know it's uh it's something that's glorified within our society and uh, amongst the you know the music or the rappers i liked and all that kind of stuff and so i i wanted to try it and then once i had tried marijuana for the first time um it really hooked me you know what i mean like it, it really gave me that that sense of fulfillment that i didn't even really know i needed but when I was around 12, 13, I really started to notice that there was something I, I started to feel that void of something missing. Mm. Um, I was molested when I was eight or nine years old in Puerto Rico. Um, and I, I wouldn't have traced it. Obviously, back then, I, I had no idea that that was there was any issues from that. I didn't think anything came from that, you know. Um, but but obviously, looking back, I could tell that definitely was kind of the, you know, that was a, a crux in my life uh, mm. when things started to kind of, you know, turn. Um, and so I, I found a, that sense of fulfillment. And from that point on, um, that was all I wanted to do. You know, like I love sports. I love playing soccer, football. But that was that was all I wanted to do in my free time was like, I just want to smoke weed. I just want to show my friends. That's all I, I wanted to do. And, you know, obviously it's normal for kids to just want to hang out with their friends of that age. But um, there was definitely a deeper um a deeper hold that it had on me you know it was mm -hmm. it was definitely like romanticized and very uh, strong hold on my life and mm -hmm. at a at an early start and um so that kind of went on and by the time i was a freshman in high school when i was 14 years old my parents had found out and at this point i was experimenting with a few other things a few other drugs and um i i started to get i, I tried uh, mushrooms for the first time when i was 15. And that was I. I would say that was the second thing that really put a um, a stronghold on on my life as far as infatuating me. You know what I mean? It was an infatuation with this spiritual realm, this idea that there was more to life. It gave me a new perspective. It gave it kind of introduced me into a, a new mindset that I never explored before. And so the the same way that the weed was, uh, you know, when I was 12, 13, 14, now the mushrooms were something that that i liked the same way 
And um, shortly after that, I actually got sent off to a rehab. And this was an inpatient rehab that was um, it was a year long and it was a two part rehab. It wasn't they weren't it wasn't the same company or whatever. But mm -hmm. in this year long program that I went to, um, I found Buddhism. And so mm -hmm. in that in that in that that space of just feeling like I was on my own being sent away, um, I found this book about Buddhism and I don't know what, like out of the whole library, I don't know what it was about it that, that made me gravitate towards it, but I, I picked mm -hmm. it up. And at that point I began, you know, studying uh, Buddhism. And I remember when I was reading it because the, the mushrooms were very fresh in my, my mind, as far as I did them, I think the same month, I think it was a few weeks before I got sent away. And so mm -hmm. I didn't, you know I me. Mean, I, I did this. I had this experience that really impacted me, really changed my life in a lot of ways or changed my perspective and just rocked my world, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what I found was that when I was reading the the book on Buddhism, that it started to kind of back up the, the same things I was thinking on the mushrooms, like a lot of the same, um, you know, framework of my mind, a lot of the same ideologies and stuff like that. It was just kind of uh, confirming it. And so they were confirming each other. And so that kind of built this idea of this is the truth in life. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And 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 I would say to this day, some of those things definitely were valuable um, because they they built in me early on, like uh, just one example, like not caring about material things, you know, which I think we can all agree is a, is a positive thing to not have, an, you know, make them an idol or whatever. And so things like that, that very early on kind of put a foundation in my life and in my heart of, of you know, towards the spiritual path of like, all right, this stuff in this world doesn't matter. It's more about, um, you know, these these higher purposes and higher ways of thinking is, is what I, I liked. You know, I was a, a spiritual seeker. And so when I got home, I was 16 years old. At that point, I um, I, I was changed. You know what I mean? And and. And I, I didn't I wasn't the same person that I was before in a lot of ways as far mm -hmm. as just my my charisma. And I became a lot more introverted. I became a lot more just in my head, you know. And um, so at 16, though, I was on I got in for my first legal trouble. And with that, I couldn't smoke weed the same way that that I was, you know, prior to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And so with that being said, I started to do do pills. I started getting okay. into pills. And um, by the time I was, you know, before I was 17, I was shooting up heroin, basically. And that began a nine year long heroin addiction. And so with within that addiction, everything was on the table. I mean, I had periods where I, there like, you know, there was a couple years where I did PCP a lot. Like I was I was heavily doing PCP. I had periods where I was heavily doing psychedelics and, and psychedelics were always one of my favorites. Um, but the heroin and, and the pills were just I needed them to, to function. So it was like I, I didn't if I didn't have those, I couldn't do the other things like so that that took priority. And so basically I was, you know, I was I was a heroin addict and it took me down a, a real dark road a real dark path for a long time and this whole time i'm having this idea of god being a uh, this idea of there is a god but i was more agnostic and and like i said I, I had these these beliefs of buddhism but i didn't i didn't connect them as like a this is a, a religion i saw buddhism as more of like um just a lifestyle you know just a, a way of understanding and respecting life and um and so going through all that I mean, there's, I'm trying to summarize, summarize sure, to say sure, yeah. other things. Um, yeah. But there, I mean, there's so much stuff that happens within yeah. that, 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 that time. There's a lot of pain that was happening. There was a lot of depression. I was extremely suicidal. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I had, I was always thinking about committing suicide. I, I would cut, I cut in myself. Well, um, why do you think you were depressed at the time? Um, well, obviously the drugs pay, play a role in that because, mm -hmm. it, you know, especially with opiates, because they burn up all your dopamine. So it's like they give you these huge hits of dopamine and then the dopamine, when you come down, it, it goes away and then mm -hmm. and then you're lower than, you know, so it's just this chase of like up and down, up and down. And every time you go up, you go a little lower down. And every yeah. time you go up, uh, you go, you're not as up as you were before, oh. you know, and so it's this vicious cycle and it just sucks. And. Um, so I think that was a part of it, but I think the other part of it was that, 
um i didn't know the purpose of life you know mm. like the other part of it was like what what are we all here for like what am i what am what am i supposed to be doing in, in life like i don't know what i'm doing and and i had you know dreams of basically being a soccer player and i think i very well could have been a professional soccer player but once the drugs got in involved you know i i it kind of took the back burner and so i didn't take it serious so i think once i hit like 18 19 i think that kind of hit me like man i could have maybe done something once i was out of high school i got my ged in jail you know what i mean so it was mm -hmm. like man maybe i could I, I had this sense of wasting talent wasting time and and regret with that and then um and then i had a baby when i was 18 um and and that was a very toxic relationship with her mom and so it was just it was just a lot of things but i think ultimately at the 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 root of it it was more just like what am i doing here you know like the whole point of life is just go work make some money and then if you don't have money you basically you can't have a life you know and so it's like this just this that that rat race you know hamster wheel kind of life that i, I felt like i i didn't want to be a part of because i did have these this idea of uh, more of a buddhist outlook on life and with that I'm like, man, this stuff doesn't matter, but this is what the world teaches us. This is like the, you know, it's like this is the the you know matrix, if you will, that we're stuck in, where this is the life that that is in front of us. And so I felt like I had to kind of um I felt like I had to either get with the program or 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 die. And um and so it was it was a lot of things, but I, I had this deep just sense of just sadness all the time and and um feeling like I was here for a reason, but not knowing what it was. And so with with that being said, it just was this long cycle of, of you know, addiction, basically. And, and I'm, you know, going through these ups and downs of trying to get clean and, and not being able to trying to go. And then really what started happening was I really started looking at psychedelics more through a spiritual lens. And, and I would use the psychedelics like acid and mushrooms and DMT and stuff. I would use them as a a way to kind of get away and so i would i would use them not as an escape in the same way that like a heroin or something numbs you or like alcohol numbs you um i would i would have these spiritual experiences and and i would go away and be in nature and stuff like that and i would feel like all right i encountered god in a sense and then i would come back to life like all right i'm ready you know like it was this idea that i that i brought back some wisdom or some you know power or some understanding and so there was this idea of like always coming back to this source of of you know through psychedelics getting the the stuff that i needed and the the, the revelations i needed and then coming back to life like okay i got it now i can and it, it was like it would work for like three days i would have like you know the, the you know like i'd have confidence yeah. i'd have you know love i'd feel loving towards people all this stuff and then it would just start fading away it's like all right i need to do it again and so i was always trying to like you know keep that i was like holding sand yeah. and you know grasping at the wind like solomon would say and it's and that was kind of what it was and um and i remember around 2012 um at this point i had my daughter was probably about a year and a half old and um my friend had just died the year before like my best friend from like mm -hmm. you know seven till he was he was 19 so seven you know i was 18 uh when he died um yeah i think i think i was 18. so yes yeah, so he died in 2010. so he had died like a, a little over a year within that you know a year time frame and he was my best friend we went through everything together we went to rehab at the same time like we both got sent off together came back around <laughs> the same time you know like we went through so much stuff the first heartbreaks together like we, we did everything together we smoked the first time i got high I was with him all that kind of stuff and um and he died and when he died it was just it was you know that first sense i ever had of like real loss of man mm -hmm. someone i really care about and now i'm out here by myself kind of feeling you know i had a bunch of acquaintances but he was only my only like true mm -hmm. friend friend you know and i had a couple other friends but once i got into um it's funny because i actually have one of my friends that comes to my bible study and he was telling me he's like you know i hear your testimony um and he's like you said you didn't have no friends he's like i was your friend you know and because he was one of my <laughs> friends i played soccer with who yeah um he was a good friend but once i got into deeper drugs you know it's like that that friendship's never really there it's you know what i mean it's like that they, they you know they care about you but they keep their distance so anyways sure. um um and so so i i hit this place where i was really sad really depressed and i started going around the same time i started reaching out to do like I, I was doing like reiki 
I was doing, I went to psychics a couple of times. I think actually once I, I went to a psychic, uh, but I went to, I had Reiki done. Um, and what is Reiki for those so, who aren't familiar? So Reiki is energy healing. Basically it's, it's an idea that we all have a, a life force energy that we have access to and it's manipulating that energy. And they believe in, you know, like clearing your chakras and, and this mm -hmm. and that. And, and that's basically what it is. So you would like lay down and these people do do these like hand signals and all this weird stuff over top of you and it's supposed to realign your your chakras it's supposed to clear out you know uh blockages and and stuff like that and you know did I you never, ever tell any difference or no I, I you know i went and one guy the first time i did it i felt like this kind of slight sense of maybe like just kind of relax while it was happening but it wasn't mm -hmm. like anything tangible it wasn't anything that marked me or anything i was like all, all right cool but it, the the thing is is that i was just desperate like for i was mm -hmm. at this point i'm like kind of like scrambling trying to find anything i can to to get help and um mm -hmm. and so and and you know that this went on there was different seasons of that this went on throughout this whole nine years you know what i mean um mm -hmm. but uh i'd say the mo you know from eight, 18 19 to like 25 was really the the main chunk of it but anyways at this one point i I basically hit this low of depression. I'm going through this this breakup that my daughter's mom is like openly cheating on me. You know what I mean? And and I my self esteem was so low that I was just letting it rock. And it was just a bad it was just a bad time. My friend died, and so basically I hit this point one night where I was you know out on my porch and and I was drinking and um, I wasn't like drunk drunk. You know what I mean? I was I was just tipsy, but I was just kind of just sitting there drinking. So I wasn't like you know real intoxicated necessarily, but I was drinking on the porch and I. I just had this moment where I said, um, I think I'm done, you know, mm -hmm. like it was just, it wasn't really this emotional thing. I just kind of sat up real calm and was like, yeah, I'm done. And, and, and so I went into my room, my, my room was in the basement. I was living with my dad at the time. We lived on a battlefield and, and so I grabbed a, a microphone cord, um, that I had and, um, I tied it to this, this fence. It was a civil war fence because I lived on a battlefield and, um, and then I, I tied around there, I tied around my neck and it's like a 20, 25 foot cliff. And then it was basically like, it's hard to explain the the layout of it, but it was basically <laughs> like a, a on the front side of our house was just a, a cliff and it was like a drop off. And then it was a stream that that broke into a um, another stream that was connected to like a river, you know? And, um, and so I said, yeah, I'm done. And I just kind of, you know, tied it, tied it, tied it to my neck and I just stepped off the ledge. <laughs> and um, there's, the next thing that happened was basically the the rope caught my neck you know i i felt that poof, and it, it pulls and so my first thought is like oh you shouldn't have done this like you know it was, it was instant mm -hmm. regret the moment that i felt that pull it was instant regret because i knew there was nothing i could do like there was nothing i could hold on to grab on to it was just and it happened so fast there's no thinking it was just oh shouldn't have done this and then the next thing i know it's like i was kind of in a dream and, and in this dream like state and in that dreamlike state, I was cold. Uh, I couldn't move and I didn't know why. So it was like being in this dream and having no idea what's going on, just being in a dream and not being able to breathe, to breathe in the dream. Hmm. And so I'm like, what is going on? And the, the thing, I have no idea what's going on. I have no memory that what I had done. And then all of a sudden out of like the, the corner of my eye to see this light. And it wasn't a huge bright light necessarily, but it was a, a it was a very it got my attention. It was a light and it just started coming closer towards me. And when I got about 10 feet away from me, what appeared like 10 feet away, um, all of a sudden the rope just I just felt so I didn't, and I didn't know what it was. All of a sudden I just felt what whatever was choking me just loosen up. Hmm. And then I felt and then I took my hands and went like this and then I popped up and I'm in the water. And so now it all hits me like what just happened. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I just like I really just did that. And so now I'm like, I'm freaking out. I'm in shock that I actually did that. And then I'm in shock that it like what actually happened. So did, did the cord like rip or no. how did you get out of it? No, that was what was crazy is that it didn't rip it. it I guess the only like, you know, obviously like logical answers, it stretched. You know, what I mean, you see I have a mic cord like right here, you know, it's like. Mm -hmm. you could see how they might stretch i guess a little bit and that's the only thing that but it, it would have had to have stretched at least like 10 feet you know what i mean and <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> so it's it's on my neck it didn't come undone for my neck obviously because i'm i'm down there you know with it still tied around my neck in the water 
and then okay it was still on your neck in the water yeah so when i'm having that dream it's still on my neck and that's what was on my neck in the dream but i didn't know yeah, you know yeah. then I, I i crawled back up the other side of the hill and i walked back around and um I didn't even look at this point. It wasn't until the next morning I looked, but I go back out the next morning. So I have something in my eye. Uh, I go back out in the next morning and the rope is still tied to the, the fence. So now I'm really bugging out like what? Like it was on my neck. And so that was really one of the crazy things. But basically what happened in that moment was that after that moment, I knew there was a God. That was basically like what came out of that is I was like, man, I'll never do that again. And now I know two things I didn't know before. One, that there's a God that something that cares about me. Mm -hmm. Like there was something that is like aware of my life and cares about me. And then two, um, that I have a purpose. Something saw fit to like save me. Something, so, you know, there was some reason that it saved me. And so I didn't know what it was. I didn't like, it wasn't like, oh, it's a Christian God, the, the God of the Bible. And, and we're doing that now. You know, it was, it was, that wasn't even on my mind at the time. You know, in, in my mind, like, uh, Christianity was just like, I just thought it was corny. Like, I don't yeah. really know how to explain why. And it's, this might sound kind of funny, but it's, it shows though, how, um, how people's, you know, encounters with us really can shape their views of God, you know, when you sure. don't know any better. And, and I remember when I grew up, there was these, this family in the neighborhood and they, they were a Christian family and they had like, you know, the, the van, they homeschooled their kids. They had like eight kids. They all like would wear like button ups every day and, you know, stuff like that. And the kids sometimes would come to play, you know, I had a good neighborhood as far as like we were always playing pickup games and stuff like that growing up. And um, these kids would like come play sometimes. And I remember they would always cry. They would always tattletale. They'd always like go tell their parents something. And they were just kind of just weird. Like they never like fit in with the other kids and they were just odd. And, and I remember like that always marked me in the sense of like, I was like, why are like Christians are just weird. Like, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, off my small encounters that I had with Christians throughout my life, um, they, it just, n there was just nothing about it that, that pulled me in, you know what yeah. I mean? Nothing about it that ever got my attention. And so with that being said, um, my idea was never like the the God of the Bible it was more based on the God that I thought I was connecting with on, on psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at, at that point, I still keep going down this journey. And then basically um, 2015, I get locked up for a year and a half. At this point, I'm really like looking into my sobriety as far as like it was the first time I started wanting to get clean. Mm -hmm. So I'm locked up for a year and a half. And, and at that point, um, I don't know why out of no, like I had a friend that I knew from the street that, that basically was in there for 13 years. And, and he um, was at this point, like five years in and um, he, he got saved, I guess, or in there or, or at some point in his stay. So he's talking about God. And for some reason that was the first seed. I think that was a genuine seed planted in my life. So that stuck with me. And then towards the end of my stay, um, I was basically like, you know what, I got to do something different in my life. You know, it was like, I'm tired of doing all this stuff. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm going to go to church. And, um, you know, at the time, there was this girl that I connected with on Facebook that I was trying to, you know, I was just trying to hook up with her, you know, but but I was genuinely also trying to get to know her. It wasn't like, oh, I was just trying to use her or something for mm -hmm. that. It was, I was trying to get to know her, but I just wanted to, you know, obviously I wanted her in a not holy way. And, and, um, sure. and um, she would be like, yeah, you can come to church with me. And that would be her like invite. And so I remember in jail, I was like, you know what? I was like, when I get out, I'm going to start going to church with that girl, I think. And so that's what I did when I got out in 2016. I started going to church with her. I would say I'd say probably almost every Sunday, like I'd say two to three times a month. I was going, you know, two, three times out of the four you know, weekends a month. So I started going to church with her. And uh, I remember one night I went to a youth night service and they, you know, the, the pastor's like, anyone want to receive Jesus? And I didn't raise my hand, but they call, called me up there. And, you know, I don't think I, I don't know that I agree with that method. Um, but they put me on the spot and were like, yeah, come mm. up and, and receive Jesus. And so I said the prayer. Nothing happened. It was, you know, again, it was like one of those things looking back where I'm like, I definitely didn't get saved at that moment, I don't think. But uh, what happened is I do think um, God was seeing that I was coming to his house, you could say. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, 
I started to throughout that year, I started to get slight convictions, like very mm -hmm. small stuff, but stuff that never would have bothered me before. I just started feeling bad about. And that was the only and I didn't know it was conviction. I didn't trace it back to it being God. It was just like, why do I feel bad about doing this now? Like, that's, mm -hmm. you know, what I mean, it was just like weird. Mm -hmm. And um, and so 2016, you know, I'm going to church, I'm doing this stuff. But nothing's happening. I can't stop getting high, man. You know, and it's like I'm, I'm but I have it very like limited as far as like using heroin. Um, but it was it would get really bad and then I would kind of ease it back in and have it where I was taking this medication called Suboxin and Suboxin was keeping me like stable. Uh, and, and so it was kind of it was kind of weird. But um, basically at, towards the end of 2017, that that summer. Uh, I ended up becoming homeless. Mm. And so uh, there was this two, three week time period where everything just hit the fan. I, I totaled two cars. Mm. Um, well, I totaled one car, but I got in two car accidents. Both of them got, I got arrested in. I got, you know, my like uh, driving on suspended and all this. It was all this stuff was happening at a very rapid rate to where it was just funny. I was like, what is going on? You know, and the thing is, is I was genuinely trying, you know, it wasn't yeah. like I was out here being reckless. I was trying so hard to get my life together. I'm working and everything is just like exploding. Like everything, everywhere I was going was like a tornado hit, you know? And, and, um, and at the time I'm like, man, I feel like I'm going to die soon. That's how it felt. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, something's going on. That's not normal, you know, and looking back now, I know it was, you know, it was God, in my opinion, it was God breaking me down to pieces because he wanted to strip me, strip everything away, you know, because that's the only way I think I was going to actually deny myself, pick up my cross and follow him. And um, so with that being said, I end up homeless. And during this time of being homeless, I am, I'm working, I'm like smoking, shooting up crack and like doing weird stuff that I wasn't even ever, didn't even like doing, but, um, I'm dating this girl that her mom is a Christian and her mom's always talking to me about spiritual warfare. I had stopped going to church because the girl I was going to church with, I, I like told her, I basically had feelings for her. And I said, I can't, it's, I don't want to be around you anymore. If you don't, if you just don't be my friend, it's too hard for me to be around you. So I don't want to go to church anymore. So I had stopped going to church. I'm working and um, I'm calling, I'm calling out to God though, this whole time. And that's something I always mention. you know, like, I, like every day I'm like praying, you know, my prayers throughout the day, just walking, I'd just be talking to God, just complaining really, but you know, crying out. And um, so I end up homeless and then basically, let me see, I'm trying to think what, uh, so this, this lady comes up to me one day at work mm. and she says, God says you need to see him. And I'm like, yeah, I know, you know, how I get in touch with him, you know, <laughs> sure, and, sure. and uh, you know, I'm like, I've been trying to talk to him, you know, but yeah. it was, it was definitely an accurate word of knowledge because the lady, it was the season of when she said it, how she said it, everything was like, I knew it was, it was real. It really got my attention. And so I went to an AA meeting like the next week and I, I left the meeting and went to the chapel because it was at a church and, <laughs> and I go in there. I'm like, Hey God, I'm here. What's up? Talk to me. And nothing happens. I, I open the Bible, just fling it open and I read the page and I'm like, all right, well, I tried, I did my part and I leave. And I come back the next week. I do the exact same thing. And halfway through the reading, I, I realized that I had read this before. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm like, dude, I read this exact same passage the last time I was here and mm -hmm. it was super accurate. You know, I remember actually like sharing it with someone be like, yeah, I think God spoke to me because look at this. And, and they were like, what does that have to do with your life? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm surrounded by death and all this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> so it's making sense to me. Sure. Um, and, and so that happens. And then I have uh, an overdose where I basically, you know, a, about a week later, I have this overdose. Um, where I basically wake up in, in, in this hallway with demons around me and I'm following one to this big giant door and I'm walking behind it. And it tells me one more step, you're almost there. And it turns around and, and it's grinning at me. And, um, I'm like, no, I'm like, hell no. And I turn around and I, I wake up in a pool of sweat. So that was the second, like, I guess thing that grabbed my attention where I'm like, all right, something's really going on here. Something's really, this stuff is real. Like, I think I was about to go to hell. And it really scared me. Mm. And um, so all this stuff is happening. Like, like within 
like within three months, it's just like all this crazy stuff is happening. My life falls apart. And then it's like, and then I started having all these demonic encounters and all this evil stuff started happening. And so I'm about to go during, um, during drug use or outside of it or no, it was, it was during, I mean, it was, it was all kind of intertwined. It wasn't, you know what I mean? But it wasn't, like I said, during this time, I wasn't really getting that high as far as, um, it's hard it's hard to explain like mm. to people that don't use to someone sure. that that ha have used before they all understand what i'm saying but to people that sure. don't use it might not make sense but like there's like times in, in use where you're getting high where you're just getting like obliterated and you're like blacking out on alcohol and you're blacking out on things and you're just like you're just going balls to the wall mm -hmm. and then there's times in your use where you're literally just using to just be normal you know mm -hmm. what i mean so like to, in your mind you're like you're you're not really high you're just taking something just so you can function in life and that's what i was doing i wasn't really um i was just using stuff just enough to get by you know i was mm -hmm. taking suboxone like once a week or something it was you know i had a very low dose and anyways that this stuff starts happening and um and so one night i basically was like planning to go to rehab the next day i said i'm gonna detox i'm, I'm done with this i need to get out of this situation and so I said, I'm going to get high one more time. At this point, I hadn't done heroin in three months, it's two or three months. Some. So I said, all right, I'm going to get heroin one more time. I'm going to get high one last time. And so I, I basically get get I, the bag I had gotten was too much to do because I knew my tolerance had lowered. And I was like, it's going to be too much to do all at once. But if I if I break it, if I break it in half, it won't be enough to get high twice. Basically, that was my my thinking. So I said, screw it. I'm going to do it all. Mm -hmm. And I had this sobering moment in in. I was in the bathroom of a hotel and I was sitting there on the floor and I basically just had this, you know, the Bible says that, that God doesn't regard an empty cry in Job. And, um, and, and I think that maybe we don't realize, you know, when our cries are empty, sometimes, you know, all of us, we think, you know, we really mean something, our heart's full behind something. And it's not, you know what I mean? If that makes sense. And so sure. at this moment, I think it was the first time I had cried out to God with, you know, not an empty heart, you know, like I, I was just dead serious and just at the end of myself. And I meant everything I said humbly. And I said, what else do you expect from me? I said, God, I've been calling out to you for a year. I said, I, I said the prayers they told me to pray. I went to the church. I've done everything. I said, what, like, what do you want from me? I said, this is all I know. And I said, I don't want to live like this. You know, I don't want to live like this. I don't know anything else. This is all I know. Forgive me. And, I, and I'm saying all this while I'm preparing my shot and I start doing the shot and I say the uh, the Lord's prayer. Mm -hmm. And 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 I said, sorry, forgive me. And I say the Lord's prayer. Boom. And then next thing I know, I, I stand up to run out the room because I knew I was going to overdose. So there's this split second of knowing it's too much. Your body like red, like it's like a it, it's this weird feeling. And um, and I run out the room and next thing I know, I'm in, in an ambulance. And so I get locked up and for five days, I'm crying out to God. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm basically begging God to have mercy on me. I'm begging him to help me. And, and I'm sitting in this room withdrawing and I basically look and it was almost as if all my life's problems and all my bad choices was in a pile in that room. Like yeah. I'm sitting there looking at the room and, and just, it broke me. Like I, I never felt so broken as far as just, man, you ruined your life. Like I knew it was my fault. I knew it was my choices. I knew it was, it was all on me. And and I felt that. And I felt the, the hurt of that. And and I said, God, I just want to be a good boy. If you can help me, please just get me out of this situation. Not to do anything other than just be there for my kid and, mm. you know, try to be a decent human. That's all I want. And um, and so I started going to this program. It was a, a Christian or faith based program. And, and I started going there. And uh, for the first two weeks, I was not liking it. Like, I was like, I want to find God, but I, I it wasn't uh, what I, I guess, the com to, according to my comfort, you know what I mean? It was like, I, I wanted this God that, that wasn't um, what was being displayed. And so these people are like praying every night and reading scriptures and these people are talking. It was just boring. I, it was like there's there was rules there. And so I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to do this and I'm about to leave. And it was it was a combination of one of my friends actually that was there he tells me he's like man it'll, it'll get better he's like i thought the same thing when i first got here um but he's like i promise man he's like you'll find peace here if you just stay and mm -hmm. um and he actually he just uh, overdosed last last year that, that that friend of mine but um he 
so he says that and then um and then i had this like voice speak to me one day that said why don't you just try and it was and basically the, what i got from it because i've had people ask me like what do you think it meant by just try and, and and i think it just meant like why don't you just for once just lay aside your thinking and you're just like just submit to something basically like just give in to this experience you're here just try like do what they're saying try and um so that's what i did and over the course of two weeks all of a sudden i knew there was no moment there wasn't like oh i encountered jesus and i was saved it was like over a couple weeks of just reading the bible every day there was a hunger that increased and then i started to notice i started to want to read the bible and then i started to like want to pray and then next thing I knew, it was like all i wanted to do was read the bible and pray and then i looked up one day and i didn't recognize myself it was like one day i looked in the mirror and everything about my heart had changed my desires like i was just a different person and and then other people started noticing it and other people started talking and then once i noticed it i and i embraced it as like this is jesus jesus is real jesus is king once I started like adding it all up and it all made sense to me what had happened, it was like, it was, it was off to the races. And so I, you know, that was my, my conversion moment, I guess. And, and in that place. And then, and, and then I got out and over the course of the next year, I spent going to halfway houses and just rebuilding my life and, you know, getting, getting a lot of things dealt with and getting through court and stuff like that. And, um, and so you know it was it was a definitely a, a heck of a journey it wasn't a, it was but everything about it wasn't like a fast thing it was a, it was a long process you know even even doing that so that's a little bit about you know <laughs> it was a, a long-winded about me but wow yeah this is um this is incredible so okay you you have this um you know over time reading scripture uh you see your life begins to change and so i guess you um you know, other people were noticing that and you started sharing your faith with others. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, um, tell us a little bit about what happened afterwards. I mean, did you did you just continue to grow in sanctity and holiness or did you just still continue to have struggles? What, what was that like? No, I actually um, man, God did a lot in me really fast. And, and there was so much stuff that just was gone. Like mm -hmm. so much stuff that just, um, but I did have, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time and I, and I, there was, uh, struggles with, you know, fornicating with her. Um, cause she would come, it was like, I was so against it and wanted nothing to do with it. And, um, I would tell her like, look, I'm a Christian. If you're going to stay with me, like I told her, God would be telling me, leave the girl in prayer, but leave the girl, leave the girl out here all the time. And, and, but I'm like, nah, I can convert her. You know, and that was my thoughts. I thought I could and I I, I wanted to. And so it, it would be like I'd see her every couple of weeks. And so I'd be living holy like when I was away from her and there was like no nothing going on and as far as sin or, you know, and um, or at least, any, you know, David says the sins I'm unaware of or that I don't know of. But, mm -hmm. you know, sins that I knew of, there wasn't anything I was engaging in. And then uh, that went on for like the first two months, I think. And, and um, then we ended up breaking up. Um, and then there was, uh, when I got out, I started smoking cigarettes because I was in this halfway house and, uh, basically everyone there was smoking cigarettes. And I was like, you know, it was, it was like that moment of like, God, look, I gave up all this other stuff. I think, I think you're cool if I just hold on to this one thing for a few months, you know, it was kind of that thing. Um, and, and, you know, it was probably God did for, for like a month. It wasn't like anything he pressed on, but then I'll never forget. I, you know, my big thing when I first got saved was I want to be love, mm -hmm. you know, like I want to be love your love. I want to be love. And so I'll never forget sitting on the porch one night. And I just, you know, just, just this quiet moment in my soul. And, and I heard what about this is love. And I know it's God, you know, it's like, it was so convicting, man. It was so loving yet so convicting. And it was like, what about this is love, Josh? Like you, you say you're wanting to be love and you all and love people, but what, but how can you say you love yourself if you keep doing this? Hmm. And so it wasn't a quick thing, but what happened is after that, I, it was so hard for me to smoke cigarettes. So what would happen is I'd buy a pack and I'd smoke one and throw them away. And then like two <laughs> days later, I'd buy a pack, smoke one, throw it away. And over probably like four or five months, I ended up breaking free from that. And so after after that, like after the first few months with those two things, 
I mean, it was, I was living very, very holy. I was, I mean, very sanctified. I was growing very rapidly. I was fasting a lot and I was seeking God. I was spending my whole day. I didn't have custody of my daughter. So I was spending my, literally my entire day just in prayer and in the Bible every day. Mm. That's all I was doing was evangelizing. Like, and so I was living pretty whole, like I was living pretty holy and pretty yeah. sanctified. Like I was 100% sold out to God. And, and, um, and so I'd say that grew. Um, but then what happened was probably about two years, uh, into this, uh, maybe a little over two years, some sometime around 2020, though, um, what started to happen was uh, I think a lot of the feelings of God kind of went away. A lot of like feeling his presence all the time, or a lot of the time, a lot of like feeling like he was speaking to me directly um, or even in the word. You know, a lot of the, the time I would read the word, I wouldn't feel like it was coming to life as much. Mm. A lot of the, the, you know, all the the fun stuff in the beginning, you know, you hear people talk about it, and I heard people talk about it. Like people told me all the time, uh, like all that zeal you have is going to go away. And I used to be like, Man, you guys are haters. Like, what you, why would it go away? You know, I'm like, I, I see God. Why would he stop showing up? It don't make sense, you know. <laughs> and and people would tell me like, oh, it's an, you're just in the first love honeymoon stage. And I'm like, well, you know, it's been it's been a, a little past the honeymoon now. You know, we're t- it's a couple years into this. And, and so. Um, that's in the conversation for another time, but you know, basically what started happening was that started to happen where God wasn't meeting this, me the same way. And then I started looking at other people and, uh, as far as why is like, I'm leading people to Jesus like every day and, and I'm like, but n- there's no fruit from, from their conversion. So I'm like, I'm out here leading people to Jesus every day, but none of them ever seem to get born again. They'll all say the prayer and say they're serious and I'll see them cry and call on Jesus, but like they don't get converted or born again. So I started looking at that and I'm kind of like, God, why does it not work? Like, why does it not work for so many people? Why is this not working? Then I'm looking, I started just getting frustrated. And the more I got frustrated, the more frustration I found. And so it was just this cycle of just, all these things I was just frustrated with. Uh, I had, I got married and I was, you know, having some troubles in my, my marriage. And there was just so much stuff was just going on. And, um, and through that, I started to question if maybe there was more to the piece of the puzzle, you know, like I started to feel like, I think there's more to this than, than what I thought, you know, Mm. I think there's more to this than just not that it was never a, a sense of like, Jesus isn't real or he, you know, it was more of like, you know what, like this is ancient, these are ancient texts and manuscripts. And, you know, I started looking into like the, the Gnostic gospels and I started to look into all these other things and, you know, like I just started to be like, all right, maybe there's just a lot more to this than I thought. And that's how it started to feel. And so with that, one day I was on YouTube and I seen a video of basically saying um, that there was a, a group of Christians in the early Christian, you know, world in the, I think in like second or third century that believed in eating mushrooms. And they thought that was the manna that fell from heaven. And I remember thinking initially, like, this don't make sense. I don't think that's true. But when I started to look into it, it just started to, it, it fed me this seed of like this idea of there being something more. And what here's the, the thing is though, that my entire conversion uh, or like after my after coming to Jesus my whole time, I never had like any desires to use heroin or anything like that. But what I did not I wouldn't say I had a desire, but what I did have was um, I had unanswered questions about psychedelics. And mm-hmm. the reason was is because they did give me, like I said, like the materialism, just there were positive things that they sowed into my life that I couldn't help but. I couldn't ignore them. And then there was also things that I got from psychedelics, like information or revelation about, you know, the spiritual life um, that I found in Christ. So I'm like, oh, the psychedelics taught me this. And now I'm seeing Jesus. This is part of the way. So I'm like, man, like maybe, maybe like mushrooms plus Jesus equals like super salvation. Like, (laughs) you know, like it was like, all right, I got Jesus. So now I have the, now I have the answer. I have the way, the truth and the life. So now if I do it responsibly and like, you know, uh, obviously, you know, within moderation or something like maybe eating mushrooms in a ceremonial way would also be a good, like, I don't think God will have a problem with that. It's natural. Now I'm hearing this video. So it was a seed that was planted and it was just building over the period of 
a few months. It was just there festering. And then my frustrations weren't really going anywhere. And I would like repent of things in the sense of my frustrations and pride or whatever. And then, um, but it wouldn't get dealt with. So it would like come right back. You know what I mean? And, and, um, so anyways, that kind of sat there for a while. Um, and then one night I was at my friend's house and, uh, I was going there to make a, you know, a song, but I knew he had, he was like one of my friends that was in the world that I didn't fully cut ties with because, you know, he was a decent friend and I didn't hang out with him enough to where it, it really influenced me. Uh, and I felt like, you know, I was being a light in his life. I felt like I could, you know, I was being positive in his life based off things he had told me. And I would just go there and make music, hang out with them here and there and, and to make music and, you know, we might get something to eat or something. But anyways, I was over there one night and, he had poured out a bag of mushrooms. And uh, I remember thinking like, this is it, you know, like you, I was so tired of the what if and the, the giant question mark in my mind, you know, it was like, you know, it's now or never, you know, it's like, I'm not, I, I knew I wasn't going to like sit there and ever seek them out. You know, I was never going to like, Hey, do you know someone that has, it was like, you know what? The, here's the opportunity. It's right here right now. And so I said, you know, I'm tired of being scared of it as well that was the other thing like i felt this this weird like scared anxiety of it and i didn't like that and so um said you know what god like you know my heart it's not like i'm out here trying to like i genuinely want to know and i genuinely feel like i'm i'm seeking you in this and um and so i, I just ate them you know i ate the mushrooms and it was unplanned and um <laughs> And so basically the first 20, 30 minutes, I'm good. Like I'm feeling good. I'm getting in a good mood. I'm in a positive, you know, mindset, I guess. And um, and then basically my friend was like, Hey, do you want to go to the bar? Um, my friends are asking, they want to meet up with me. Do you want to come or do you want to stay here? And I'm like telling him basically, obviously not, man. I, you know, I, I just ate these things. I don't want to go to the bar. And so I, I stay at the house and he leaves. And the first thing that happened is that that I'll never forget is that. I felt like I got set up. That was the initial first reaction was my spiritual. Cause here's the thing. My, at that point, like I had told you, I was living consecrated. I was living a fasted lifestyle. I was living, um, I was spiritually growing. And so my spiritual, you know, eyes were aware, like I was aware of the spirit world, you know? And so, uh, still being sober minded, um, I start to to basically sense demonic uh, presences in the room. And so I feel them walk in like a, a cloud. When he walks out, I feel them walk in. And it was almost the first thing was interesting is he got up and kind of looked around. And he said, I'm going to leave. And I remember when he walked out, it was like he had been used. Like he had 100% been used as a vessel, manipulated to, you know, to get me to, into this house to take these things. And then when he left, it was like, all right, we got it from here. That was the feeling, it, you know? So they, this demonic presence enters the room. He leaves the room, they come in and I'm like, oh, wow. I'm not even, you know, the mushrooms haven't even kicked in yet. And uh, I'm like, oh, I know what that is. You know, I've, I've, I've dealt with that presence multiple times in prayer and, and stuff like that. And, and um, through warfare, you know, like warfare, praying and, and attacks from the devil I've had, you know, there was, um, I've had nights where the, you know, I felt demons lay in my, my bed to scare me and, you know, scratch their nails on the bed. Like I had some very, very, uh, genuine, um, demonic encounters through, through seeking Jesus and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So anyways, this, this presence come in, I know what it is. And uh, I'm kind of sitting there like, all right, I'm, if I get psyched out, then it's going to be, it's going to take me the, the wrong way. You know, like I was like, I still have to keep my mind right. I can't start looking at this or it's going to take me down. A, a, I'm going to have a bad trip. So I go to the bathroom and uh, I put water on my face. I'm giving myself this like tripping pep talk of like, you know, it's all in your head, um, you know, and I remember I, I smile and I said, you know, Josh, you ate mushrooms. Um, you can't die. They're mushrooms. <laughs> and um, and I remember as soon as I turn around and like wipe my face, I hear God speak to me and says, who says I can't stop your heart whenever I want? And it wasn't an intimidating way. It wasn't a it was a you understand, like your life's in my hands, like 
you ever seen you know i'm thinking about like you ever seen like a thousand ways to die it's like you know what i mean like all these things people die in the most bizarre <laughs> ways like and so you know i'm thinking from a, a scientific natural pr perspective like you can't die from shrooms like it's not possible to to really overdose from shrooms and so that was the first thing where god checked me of like what what do you mean you know and so i'm like oh snap this is real and basically it hit me i go back into the room these present the demonic presence is still there in the room and i'm sitting there like this just started like what did you do you know and and, and i'm still trying to i'm kind of like still trying to be positive and ignore it though so i'm trying to just like listen to music or something and but i can't deny it and it felt like the room was suffocating me like it was just closing in on me and i could just feel like like it, it it was very strange it was this cold and dark feeling of of you know pulling the life out from money and i started to pray basically mm. and what started happening was when i prayed i would feel the demons around me and i would feel like i was repenting i was like god have mercy lord you know have mercy on me a sinner like i'm praying all these things and um when i would stop because then I'm thinking like, all right, well, God forgives me or he doesn't forgive me. Like, uh, you know, I don't have to beg for forgiveness, but I'm like, man, I can't escape this. This trip just started. It's like this is going to be like five or six hours. What's going to happen, basically? And um, and so when I would stop, though, it would get worse. And so I would go back to prayer. And um, basically what started to happen was I just started to feel my life, like my breath just get harder. It was harder to breathe. It just started to just be... It, uh, I just started to kind of not really panic. It wasn't really, that, you know, because I know some people probably think I had like a panic. It wasn't a panic attack. I literally felt like um, I, f I could feel the, the demons around me and I could feel them basically closing, like just there, like I was getting spiritually jumped or something. And, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get rid of what I knew was happening. And so basically at one point I call my wife and tell her to come pick me up. And so uh, I, I'm telling her to come get me i get in the car she doesn't know what's happening i get in the car and at this point i was basically starting to get like pulled out of my body so while i was in the room before i got in the car there was points where it was like i was feeling like it felt like something was trying to pull my soul out of my my spirit out of my body um and so it was like it's very hard to explain and that's the thing with some of this stuff it's like it's it's hard to put into like mm -hmm. english words you know but um so I get in the car and at this point I'm like getting pulled out of my body and then thrown back. It's like if we're talking right now and then all of a sudden I just you just feel your spirit or like your soul just get this yanked out of your body and your physical body just goes to sleep or something. And mm -hmm. and so that's what was happening. But there was no like I wasn't seeing anything, hearing anything. It was just this and I couldn't breathe during this. So I'm telling her and she's genuinely scared because she's hearing me like hyperventilate. And she's like, oh, my gosh, what's happening? And I'm trying. But but the thing is, is I'm getting pulled into the spirit realm. So I couldn't really talk to her whenever I would like I would be trying to talk to her and I'd be like, I can't breathe. Just pray for me. And then I'd get pulled back out of my body. Right. And mm. and so this is this whole thing is happening. I'm freaking out a little bit because I can't breathe. And we get to my house. I, I run inside and I basically, you know, just throw myself on the floor. I just run inside and throw myself on the floor. And at this point, I'm just like fully thrown into the spirit. So I just I'm, I'm out of my body. There is a somewhat of a, you know, life cord. I could I'm aware of what is going on in the natural as far as i can't i'm not really seeing anything but i'm aware like if my wife said something to me there was a it was like i was connected to what was going on so if she spoke to me it was like i could kind of come back but i i couldn't even stay it was really weird like I, it was mm -hmm. something was greater than me was pulling me back into this spirit realm so i'm in then i'm getting pulled back into another realm and so anyways i'm i'm in this black void and i don't know what's going on i don't see anything at this point and then all of a sudden once i kind of had stayed there for a moment because up until this point it was like in and out in and out once i kind of stayed there vision and stuff started to come to me and next thing i knew i was in a giant hand and I'm, so i'm in this giant hand i see these like big fingers and i'm in this palm like a, laying there like a baby and i'm looking around and then i look up and i just see like 20 30 demons just standing there you know like a whole group of them some bigger than others and i realized my first initial initial reaction is oh i saw those demons in the dream when i overdosed it was like they were the same ones plus some other ones and um 
And then at this point, one giant, like one that was probably like 15 feet tall, taller one, stands up and he says, we're tired of this kid. And they said, he keeps coming to our kingdom and taking people out. And then he came back and he ate off our table. And so I'm like, oh, snap. Like, this is real. Like, I, it was like, I mean, dude, the amount of scripture that's flying through my head at this point. You know, like there was, <laughs> there's so much scripture flying through my head. There's so much like just revelation of like, oh, you really screwed up, you know, like this is not, this is not good. And um, so there's like a, a lot of fear happening. I'm, I'm going through physical discomforts, but then I look over and it was, and then on that side, I see the other side, I see the kingdom of heaven. And in the way I would describe it is this, this huge tower like thing of light where the walls were, everything's made of like pure light but there was structure to it and it was just it just i don't know it wasn't like a, a height tall it just went on forever kind of sent that's how it's, i sensed it as like just going on forever mm. um but at the top of it i knew it was the glory of god like i knew it was god the father like the fullness like you it was like I, you could sense that that was the the ultimate authority in that wherever i was at right and because when they're speaking, they're like everything's directed towards up there. And I'm kind of like in the middle of this tower thing somewhat. And and so this thing's happening. And at this point, I'm I'm having trouble breathing still. I'm going, I'm feeling like my insides are shriveling up and I'm dying. I'm going through just basically the worst inner turmoil. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking about like all the ways that um I guess. I was wrong, you know, like uh, I'm thinking I'm getting humbled by the hand of God, basically. And I'm sitting there laying there and I'm just asking God to have mercy on me. I'm asking God to forgive me. Um, and it's not really stopping. And so this goes on for a while. And um, and, you know, at one point and then after the demons had said that there were sitting there and they were talking still, but I couldn't hear them. And that's to this day, that's one of the things that really, I, I really wish I could know what was going on because I think there was a lot of legalities that was, they were speaking on. Um, and cause they're still, it's like they were presenting a case, like a court case, you know, and they're, they're accusing me. And uh, just like we see in Zechariah three, you know, with uh, Joshua, the high priest, and it was the same kind of thing. And so they're accusing me and I don't know what they're saying though, after the initial, you know, statement, and so this goes on for a while. And, and basically, at some point, I started to tell God that, you know, I'm, I'm tired of uh, I'm tired of this. And I, I, I just trust that he's good. I'm basically, like, you know what, Lord, I screwed up. I, but I, tr I, I was so exhausted. Like, I can't explain because I was like interceding for myself. But I was so tired, I just couldn't do it anymore. I felt so exhausted. And uh, I said, you know what, Lord, because I could feel myself just dying. Like it was like I could feel myself further and further getting pulled into that reality. And I could like, like I was getting further and further away from the natural realm. And um, I basically said, you know, what? I trust that you're good. And I believe that um, that you'll do what's right. And I just pray that you have mercy on me and forgive me. I said, I give up. I like, I said, I literally said, I commit my hand to you. I commit my spirit to you. Like, and, and I started to feel myself start really drifting into it. Like, okay, this is it kind of thing. And, um, but then there was something inside of me that tells me, you know, you need to fight, like, keep, keep fighting for yourself, keep praying for yourself. Like, and so I would like start moving again and just have mercy God and forgive me and all this stuff. And, um, and then I started to think about my, my daughter and my wife was pregnant. And so I started to think about, you know, basically like leaving my kids and, uh, and how terrible that would be. And, and then I started to have this extra thing inside of me kind of come out where it was like, no, I need to be here. Like, and so I, I, it was when I started to really put myself to the side and I started to think about the people I was here for. You know, I was like, Lord, I know you called me for a reason. I know, you know, I already been, I, I know you have a calling on my life. I've been, I was, you know, getting prepared for it. Like, I know, you know, I have a family on the way. I need to be here for them and, and all this stuff. And so I started talking about that to God and I started to feel somewhat of a, of, of a easing, like somewhat of a, like a release, not a lot, but enough to where I was like, oh, I think that was that did something, you know, and um, and then at that point, I saw a cloud of witnesses come around me. So mm -hmm. there's like six or seven saints that come like hovering above me kind of. 
and they were praying for me. So now the saints are praying for me. And I started to feel more of a more and more of a ease. And um and the interesting thing is that even before so before this happens, though, and the one point I always point out is that the, the one of the craziest parts was that every breath was getting sent to me. So when I was talking about like, you know, like I couldn't breathe, it literally felt like if you just squeeze the breath out of, or like if you have like a plastic bag and you just squish it, like that's how mm-hmm. I felt. Like I was getting the breath, like just stretched, um, um, pushed out of me. But then it was like, when I get, got a breath, it was like, God was sovereignly like sending it to me. It was like, like I could see it almost coming to me and I knew it was coming from him. It was, so I'd breathe out like, and then you'd be there and it'd be like a minute. It felt like where I was just like suffering and then I would see like a breath get sent to me and then I'd feel it hit me like and then I'd breathe again and be like and I would it and because they were coming so spaced out, it was like I cherished them so greatly. You know, it was like it was such a it was they were so meaningful and like so special. It was like that was my life at the you know, the time, like this is all I have. I need it. And so, anyways, I'm getting and so I started to feel after the saints came, I started to feel like a a, a sense of breathing easier. Like I started to slowly get like calmer, like, okay, I can breathe better. Uh, and then at one point I see the, the, uh, a cross come out, like a shadow of a cross comes out. And so it was in this moment in turn and what's going on with me is, and how I saw this was, it was this moment where God remembered the cross. It was like God was was there was like this anger towards me. There was this wrath of like you broke you. This was a major infraction. I knew better. You know, it wasn't like I was some some um, babe in Christ necessarily. It wasn't like I I I, I knew better. I was uh, you know what I mean. I should have known better. Mm-hmm. And I uh, you know I wasn't living. I wasn't living like a rebellious mm-hmm. uh, Christian life. I was. I really was living for God. And I just had this moment of making a bad decision and. Um, so it was like God remembering what Jesus had done. And then all of a sudden I see Jesus come out of the, out of the kingdom. And so I look over and I see the entire attention of everything goes towards him and I'm looking and he comes towards me and he puts his arm around me and he said, this one is mine. He belongs to me. And as soon as he had touched me, I go back to my body and I'm puking. So I, I, it's like he touches me, and the second he touches me, I shoot back to my body, and now I'm back in my room, puking, just throwing up, and I fall, I collapse on the floor. Like it was like it felt like I had been up for a week, and you know, like just everything in me was just gone. I had no strength whatsoever. I collapse on the floor, and now I'm thinking like, all right, this is it's over with. This is you know what I mean. Thank God. Um, you know, I mean, I couldn't even, I, I, I was in shock. I couldn't even process anything at the, that moment. But then I found myself back on my, after I finished throwing up, I found myself back in the spirit. Except this time I'm standing inside. Uh, I'm standing inside of that kingdom. So now I'm surrounded by light. I know I'm out of the darkness. And, and I'm standing there and I look and the first thing I see is Jesus. And he's just looking at me with his, his eyes are just filled with, with love. They're just filled with this, with light. And they were they weren't like just one color. It was like they, they were, they were like brown, light brown with, with blue and green, like all mixed in one almost. And they just reflect like, like you can't really see anything else. You know what I mean? It's like, you're not, it's like once you, his, you see his eyes, they penetrate you in a way where everything else disappears and you're just locked in and you feel like it, it feels like he's, he's coming into you and also bringing you into himself. It's just, it's a very, it, that's probably the most powerful thing I could ever explain about anything. And, um, and so the first thing he's sitting there smiling at me, he says, maybe we shouldn't do that again. And he said it and with a smile and like almost, and like almost, you know, not jokingly, but it was, it was, you know, like he said it as a friend would say like, Hey man, like, yeah, we probably shouldn't do that again. And it was, and that's exactly how he said it. Like, maybe we shouldn't do that again. And he smiled at me and, and I'm just sitting there like, what, what, you know, like, I don't know what to say, what to do, because I'm still thinking about what just happened. I'm in shock of mm-hmm. this whole thing. And so I'm just sitting there like, I just did this, this, this you know, I mean, all this stuff just happened and I, I can't forgive myself, basically. So I'm going through this moment where he's putting his arm around me, walking me through this kingdom and I'm seeing 
um, I'm seeing like that there's other uh, beings there, whether they were saints or angels. Um, I'm seeing that there's glory in this place. Uh, I could see the 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 father was I like again the father was up on the top. Like I knew that the the Godhead like was up there, and I couldn't even like really look. It was like I just you could like looking straight. I could see the glory of God in front of me, but I didn't even want to look above me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so I get this sense in heaven that like some of the beings there were like disappointed in me again to like you knew better. You know what I mean? And 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 so, man, I'm just like sitting there feeling really, really bad. But all at the same time, I'm feeling like amazing because Jesus had just saved me. He just you know, what I mean, so I'm feeling so full. And I'm feeling loved by Jesus and, and like he's proud of me. It's it's crazy. And then but I couldn't shake this feeling of that. I messed up and mm. and and I couldn't forgive myself. And so I, I sh literally was like, think I think I'm like, I want to go to the lowest place in this place. And I, and I shoot off and I, and I find myself at the bottom of the bottom of like everything. And I just get on my knees and my my face, and I'm just like, I, I just want to worship. And I start saying, God, just let me worship. And that's the that's the next thing is like the the revelation of we, you know, of of God telling us to worship, or people thinking we need to worship. It's like no, like the real the real thing behind it is like let me worship. Like it says in uh Philippians 3 3, it says, Who worship who we who worship by the spirit of God, which means we need the spirit of God to even worship God. It is the spirit within us that it that even allows us the gift to worship. So there was this idea of like, um, I want to worship, like that let me do just that and nothing else. I don't want anything mm -hmm. else from you. Just let me, you know, praise God and and um and and so I'm I'm just worshiping God and I'm thinking about all the I'm thinking about preaching the gospel and I'm like I don't think I could ever do that again like this place is so holy and I'm realizing just like in Isaiah six like woe is me like you know and and I'm like there's no way that that I could ever preach again I don't want to talk anymore I don't want to do anything like I just want to die and almost and just, you know like just just like you mm -hmm. the revelation of man I'm really unholy I'm really not perfect i'm not righteous on my own and um so that was very prevalent in that moment it was a deep deep humbling um and then all of a sudden jesus comes back to me and basically he you know and mind you everything that's being said and spoken is 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 all just known it's it's all telepathically just known it's like as soon as you think to say something the answer comes as soon, you know what i mean as soon as as like he just looks at you and you just know what he said and um and so he basically like deals with me as far as reminding me that it's him who who qualifies you know what i mean it's him who he brought me here and he's he's the authority you know what i mean he's loves me he wants to walk with me up there you know it was like this he basically brought me to the end of myself of like look it's this is what i want so what do you care about what anyone else would think or even what you think i want you with me come with me so then we go back and we're walking through and I just and there was a confidence with me, you know, so this time when I'm walking through, it's kind of like he, he hey, he, he chose me to come walk with him. I don't know. I don't know. You know, what I mean, um, and then so we, we kind of walk around. There wasn't anything that was like specifically shown to me. It was just I just, it was just like walking around this place of, of light and, and, and glory. And like, here's the thing is that. I knew that, I mean, this place, you knew that there was just so many other things to see there. Like I knew there it was a bunch of stuff there. There's a bunch, I don't, but we were just walking around like just almost like a road almost. And, 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 um, but then at one point I basically find myself apart from him in the same way that dreams kind of just change where, you know, like you're in a, in a mall and then all of a sudden you're in a room. Mm -hmm. um, it was like that, but I found myself almost in this ball of light or something like it was just, it there was so much it was like lights around me and it felt like i was just like felt like stuff was moving past me at the speed of light but i was just kind of there just floating somewhere and um and all of a sudden everything that i ever wanted to know about life was just flooding me the answers to everything i could ever ask were hitting me uh everything i want to know that's all i could tell you is like I started to understand everything that I ever wanted to understand. And then at one point, what started to happen was I started to feel like it was too much. 
And I literally started to say, God, stop, you're going to kill me. It started to feel like I was getting pumped full of so much wisdom and understanding and just life that I was going to explode into a trillion pieces. And the, and the more that he gave me, the it was like, it was weird, man. It was like this. It was like the love of God, the mercy of God, the wrath of God almost was there. It was like experiencing the fullness of God all at once. And it's like I could almost see how how um, his 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 love, is, you know, the fire of his love, the refining fire. It was like all experiencing so much of it at once. It felt like it was going to kill me. And so I, I started to say, OK, I've seen enough. And because God's telling me through this, isn't this what you wanted? isn't this what you wanted? You know what I mean? And I'm like, yes, but this is all right. I get, you know, like it was almost like what I wanted was torturing. It was almost like, you know what it reminds me of? I just actually was reading this. It's almost like whenever um, Israel commanded the quail and God gave them so much quail they got. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's was it I, a feeling of purgation? Um, not necessarily. It was just a feeling of, of um, knowing more than I needed to. It, mm -hmm. Like, understanding more than i needed to and then knowing i didn't deserve it, mm -hmm. it you know and knowing that i didn't like i didn't earn that the right way and so it was like this almost this like man god is so good you know um th that's the only thing i can say but i i started to say all right lord just send me home. just send me back just send me out just send me back just send me back i don't i don't want to be here anymore like but I wanted to be there. It wasn't because it wasn't good. I just literally couldn't take. I said, "You're mm -hmm. gonna kill me." That you know, and I knew that these things would kill people. If like, like I was like, "This is what Earth is for." And I, it's so hard because when I sometimes when I listen to myself say some of the stuff, I'm like, "This sounds crazy," but it's like, I don't know how to put it in words any other way. It's like it's like this Earth protects us. Like if everyone was aware of what, like if if everyone on the normal street was just aware of what was really going on in the spirit around them, they would all, they would, you would die from fear. Like, or, you know what I mean? Like they, there was, people would be shocked to understand they're sitting there living with demons in their house their whole life. And you know what I mean? And, and dining with demons and dating demons. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, it, and so I basically was like, you know, just send me back. And so slowly it started to kind of fade out. And the next thing I know, I kind of was like, almost like he carried me back and just, put me to sleep or something and i i wake back up in my my body and it was like the biggest there was probably i've never experienced more of a like a fresh breath of like relief of like mm -hmm. it's over and the second it was over it was like i was i was sober-minded i was just it was like this this sigh of relief and um and yeah and so that, that, then after that i basically i got in bed and it was already it was really late at this point and um the rest of the night though i could i could like hear the holy spirit very clearly you know like it was like i had this open line of communication the rest of the night um and it's crazy man because you know like god told me all this stuff was going to happen as far as like the 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 um being on the 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 interview I mean, he didn't tell me with michael knows but he told me that night and i never shared this actually publicly but like I knew all this stuff was going to happen. He told me this, this whole experience right here, I'm going to use this to basically get introduce you to the world. Like this is going to, I'm going to use this to get your name out of there. And this will be part of your testimony. Um, and he told me, you know, he's like, a lot of people are really not going to, there's a lot of Christians that aren't going to honor you because of it, because they're going to look and say like, basically the way that you got this was, wasn't correct, you know? And, and mm -hmm. so, um, I, I knew that it was it was really interesting how I knew a lot of this stuff was going to happen. He told me all that that night. And um, and so, yeah, that was, you know, definitely never doing that again. You know, um, learn my lesson with that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious, you know, when an individual has these kinds of experiences, one of the way to judge it is by its fruits. What has been the fruits that have, you know, has has come from that experience? That's what I always tell people because a lot of people, you know, there's there's obviously people that think it was like all demonic and it was all a demon tricking me. And I'm like, you know, my thing is like, man, do you really think that Satan could embody perfect love? You know, like, mm -hmm. can he actually he can masquerade as a being of light, but can he mm -hmm. masquerade as Jesus? So you think G Jesus would actually allow him to put on Christ mm -hmm. to I mean, it, it was too, too pure. But my biggest thing is that that's what I say is what look at the fruit. Mm -hmm. The fruit is that it scared me away from from psychedelics and and drugs more. Mm -hmm. It it put more of a fear of the Lord in me. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 
the fear of the Lord grew much greater after that. Um, it grew me to a place of understanding worship better. Everything about that experience built on my revelation of Jesus Christ and built on my love for him, uh, solidified everything I, I thought I knew. And um, apart from that is, I mean, I've gotten hundred, literally hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of people giving their life to Jesus, rededicating their life to Jesus, uh, or um, not doing, like, I mean, at least a hundred testimonies of just people saying, I was just about to do mushrooms or psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian or I was, you know, and I saw mm -hmm. this and now I'm not. Um, and then I have a lot of people that, you know, might not have touched them necessarily as much spiritually, but they don't want to get high anymore. They're like, I don't mm -hmm. want to do drugs anymore. Um, so that's how I see the fruit of it. I mean, the fruit, I can't see anything about it that actually, actually, I can't think of anything about it that that's been like a, a yeah. negative fruit. The only thing about it that I've seen that could be, a, and this is actually why I didn't share that for like two years. So, you know, it was like two years after the fact that I scared, shared that testimony. Mm -hmm. the, the reason I, I held on to it so long is for one, I waited to feel like God was telling me to share it. But then two, it was because I didn't want anyone to, I didn't want it to possibly provoke anyone to think that like, Oh, if I do that, maybe I can have an experience like that. Or mm -hmm. like, you know what I mean? For people to think like, well, look, this guy did it. And it, it cause some people are like, yeah, it was bad. But then the end, it was good. And in, in the end of it all. And I'm like, look, if you, if you, my thing is like, if you think that in your heart, you immediately have gone into re like, that's you're doing it 100% out of rebellion and like thinking you're going to like, manipulate god into like that wasn't my heart behind it you know like my yeah. heart was genuinely like I, I i think that this might be okay to experience with god but i'm out here telling people it's not it's not the way you know and and so if you think it's it i don't i think it might end up being worse you know um so yeah i, I, I mean uh, i know we're, we're running up against the clock here but i want to ask you this i mean what would you say to somebody who maybe is watching this and says, okay, well, I'm thinking about doing some of these things. Well, what would you say to them? Any advice? My advice would be, I get it as far as like, I understand. And here, cause the problem is, is like the world is pumping this stuff out there. The world specifically with psilocybin and mushrooms, they are 100%. Uh, and even, even with the, uh, you know, ayahuasca, all this stuff, society has embraced it in such a large scale. And sign and and I'm I I have to be honest, you know I cannot just just for the sake of being biased towards what I believe, uh, which I do believe 100%. But I have to be honest that there is scientific you know uh, backings to support some of these things. You know they are seeing somewhat results of things. But one thing I tell you or tell people is just because something has a good result does not necessarily mean that the source of it is good. And so. For I'll give you this example. Let's say that you and I met up tomorrow and I have uh, $5,000 in cash and you have $5,000 in cash. And uh, you're like, yeah, you know, I'm like, well, how'd you get your money? Let's go shopping, you know, and I can buy the same clothes as you bought. But let's say that I, you know, you, you work for your money, but I said, no, I robbed a bank. The money's just as good as your money. Um, I can buy the same things you can buy with that money, but the way that I went about getting my money is illegal and therefore mm -hmm. there's repercussions. And so that is how I look at it is that you're playing with fire and you really do not know what you're allowing into your life or not into your life. Like I did these psychedelics hundreds of, you know, at least over a hundred times, you know, um, uh, mushrooms and ass all I've done all these things a lot of times. And I thought for years that they were blessing me. I thought for years they were doing um, you know, giving me understanding and peace and all these things, but they were also um, sowing craziness and, and cursings into my life. And like mm -hmm. the suicide attempt, um, I think it was. DMT I we, hmm? we, well, I lost you for just a second there. Can you repeat the, the last sentence? Uh, saying that when I did a D, uh, DMT trip, uh, that I had a really profound DMT trip, and I mm -hmm. I had my suicide attempt two weeks after that. Mm -hmm. So you get what I'm saying? Like I, on one hand, you're thinking like, oh, I'm doing all this good, but then under the surface, it's sowing all this mm -hmm. other stuff. Possibly, I just met a girl, um, probably a two month a month or two ago. 
she can't, I did a prayer night. She comes to the prayer night and, and for the whole prayer night, for some reason, I keep praying about mental illness. I keep feeling led to pray for mental illness. And so I, I asked her after the service, what would she like specific prayer for? She said mental illness. So she tells me that basically she was a yoga teacher. Um, and she started getting into uh, MDMA for, um, uh, uh, for therapeutically. So she gets into MDMA therapeutically with her boyfriend, and then they start following this teacher. I can't remember his name, but she says that basically he's he does you know acid therapy kind of thing, and and hmm. so it's she's a yoga teacher. She's in all that kind of stuff, and um, so she starts doing. She took acid, I guess, with her boyfriend, and she basically completely lost her mind, and she was almost permanently, um, you know, given into a. Um, a, a psych ward basically she was committed and almost permanently for so she was committed to the hospital for almost two years and almost permanently almost lost her kids her whole life and she basically took two years to just kind of regain somewhat of her mind and and when i met her i could tell like yeah there was some stuff that wasn't you could tell was off and um so that's what i always tell people like there shouldn't be such a high risk of things going bad i've heard so many horror stories i've had my own horror stories that i've seen or that i've seen firsthand um with people tripping like why is there so many you know psychedelics have there's a lot of risk there as well and so i think if something's pure in nature i don't think there should be such a high risk involved with it either you know what i mean like I don't have to worry like if I drink water that it's might all you know there's a chance that I'm gonna like burn my kidneys up or something you know like <laughs> do you think that there's um a risk of demonic activity involved with uh, the use of psychedelics? What I think is that they they do open you up to the spirit realm and if you mm -hmm. look at people that take psychedelics they they all would agree I would say that they're real like because a lot of people especially you know people didn't take them they're like people think like oh you're just high you're just, and it's like dude you know when you take them you know what's like oh this is the drug uh things get manipulated or exaggerated you can tell like oh this is just me on the drug and then you can tell like oh this is a real this is real and so i think that they 100 percent open you up to the spirit room they open that door and that's that's the whole thing is that when you open up the door on uh, through a legal access you give the demons rights to essentially um play with you however they want and they're mm -hmm. not going to show their face they want to stay hidden so therefore they are going to make you enjoy this experience they want you to 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 laugh they want you to have fun and while you're opening these doors to demonic activity in your life they are coming into your life and they are doing and you might not know that's the thing is mm -hmm. it's like people think like oh well i got happier after doing this well how do you know that like it didn't it didn't land you and like maybe you get i don't know maybe you get cancer in 10 years from now or maybe your kid ends up born you know wrong or something you know what i'm saying like there's so many people think of the the side effects of something has to be in this little box pertaining mm -hmm. to them immediately but you have no idea how far this ripple could go and what, you know. So, yeah, I definitely believe that you open yourself up to, to demonic activity. And I think you were saying that you encountered light beings whenever you would engage in this. So you encountered some of this stuff. Yeah, no, I, ha I had these encounters with light beings and stuff. And, and the one thing I remember about them is they seemed loving. They tried to portray love. They basically tried to act peaceful. They were peaceful towards me. They tried to, they basically, were, and the, it was funny as they were doing the Reiki hand signs. Mm -hmm. So one of the, one of, one of the light beings was doing, he was doing stuff with his hands and he was going over me. So they seemed loving. They seemed mm -hmm. like they were there to help me. They even gave me positive feedback about my life. They were telling me to stop doing drugs, stop getting high. However, there was always this underlining, I don't trust you feeling. It was mm -hmm. almost like being in the ocean and having feeling like there's a shark swimming under you. Like there was always this murky water sense to it. Like there was even the one, you know, even looking back on the ones I enjoyed and the times that I did, you know, like I had another one where the uh, girl was like dancing around with me with a lollipop. And like it was like they were throwing a party for me. Um, it was, you know, it was weird, but there's something about it where I'm like, dude, these there's something creepy about these things, whatever they are. There's something not right. And I always felt like that. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely think that. 
you know, wrapping it up here, uh, which you said earlier in your, your experience about how the, the demon was saying, you know, he continues to eat from our table or he comes and eats from our table. It reminded me of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 21. I imagine it's also something you thought of as well. It says, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the uh, table of the Lord and the table of demons. And so I, that, that was one part that really jumped out at me because yeah. of that verse. I imagine oh, you yeah. thought of that as well. Oh yeah. No, that, that 100% came to my mind. And that's how I look at it is it's like, look, like the, the devil has his, his table with his, his, you know, um, his delicacies, you could say his, his food. Mm -hmm. That's how I, I mean, and that's how I see it all. It's like, God's given us you know, his word and he's given us our food and he's given us what we are supposed to feast on. And unfortunately, most of this world is is the devil's, you know, playground. A lot of this world is his food. He controlled you. I mean, just look at the entertainment industry and Hollywood and all this. I mean, craziness going on. I mean, so a lot of times I think what happens is people think. Because so many people are doing it that's what makes it okay but we always forget that the road is narrow you know and, sure. and very few find it and so yeah um but yeah well hey look i appreciate you coming on and doing this so much this was incredibly interesting and i hope it's beneficial to everybody who watch uh, josh is there anywhere that uh you could point people to to uh follow you maybe on social media and the work that you're doing any any, any plugs you want to put in yeah, um, you can follow me on uh, Instagram uh, at Joshua underscore Kingdom Priest, as well as TikTok. I'm not too. I, I know some people try uh, follow me on Facebook, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I don't really. I'm not really active on there. I don't really check messages or anything like that very often. That's why I, I think I seen yours. Uh, yeah, on, on Instagram. Instagram. First. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't really check Facebook too much. Um, but yeah, uh, TikTok, Instagram, and then I have a YouTube channel as well called Joshua Zatkoff. It's just just my name, and so. Yeah. What are you doing on the channel? Um, um, about I, these or? Yeah, I started doing a podcast as well. Uh, and then I, I, I've been trying to get more active. I want to start getting more active on it with the more evangelist like videos mm -hmm. doing uh, getting just that kind of stuff. So uh, there's some street preaching and then just podcast episodes I have on there as well. Cool. I'll, I'll definitely check it out and also put a link to that in the show notes. Josh, thank awesome. you so much for coming thank on. I know you me. stayed a little extra too. So I know. Sorry. You're good. You're good. You're good. But, but again, thank you. And everybody, y'all, thank y'all for watching. Hit the like button and the subscribe button. And also check me out. Patreon.com forward slash reason.